Good morning. Thank you once again for inviting me to this very iconic institution, the TSRH, arguably one of the best children's hospitals in the world. I can't help but remember my time as a resident at the Children's Orthopedic Hospital in Mumbai, where I learned all my club feet and developed a lifelong passion for the treatment of these. Thank you very much, Alex, Mikhail, Professor John Birch, for giving me the opportunity to be amongst you. We know that neglected and relapsed club feet have problems like stiffness, fibrosis, hidden Taylor dome flattening where we can't see it initially, and incongruity of the, not only the subtalar but all the other joints of the hind foot and the midfoot as well. So what do you do when you have children and young adults presenting to you with different uh, degrees of the same problems? Many of them have been operated in the past, typically with posterior medial soft tissue releases, and their feet are really very stiff, and how do you take care of them? The x-rays also come in various sizes and shapes. You have different deformities in the hind foot, in the midfoot area, in the forefoot area. So how do we draw up some kind of an algorithm? So the one that I have developed with experience over years, and of course has been passed down to me through many of the great workers in this field, is determining the presence or absence of Taylor dome flattening. If the Taylor dome is spherical, it is quite possible for us to achieve correction through the ankle, either through casting or uh, uh, hinge distraction using any method of external fixation, or with the kinesiological correction in the complex club feet that I've had the privilege to develop. If, however, the Taylor dome is flattened and there's very little movement in the ankle joint, we have to resort to osteotomies like the supramalleolar, the U, and the V osteotomies. Before I got started on the Ponsetti method, we did use the Elizaro for almost 12 to 13 years back in my country, and it's easy to put on an Elizaro frame in a patient who presents like this. This is not a club foot, but a post-burns contracture. And in somebody who has got a spherical Taylor dome, we can determine the axis of the ankle, which lies just above the lateral process of the talus, and try and do a simulation either with a butter paper or with a software, which I did using a simple vector graphics software like freehand or coral draw and figure out where to place the hinges. We know, of course, of the Inman's uh, axis that goes from the medial to the lateral malleolus and the shape of the talus being the frustum of a conic. So in such cases, if we can accurately place the hinges at the level of the Inman's axis, we can place the hind foot motors anywhere, keep the forefoot connections on a passive mode and just distract posteriorly to achieve a good correction like so. But this was just the beginning of the story, and there are so many articles in the literature dealing with the Elizaro frames in correcting deformed club feet and neglected club feet. I just want to hark back to this one case. This is a 22-year-old lad with this kind of neglected club foot. He does have a reasonably spherical Taylor dome. How do you think we can deal with this? Well, what we did in this case also at the age of 22 was posterior lateral soft tissue release with casting. Just one word or, or one small animation hopefully that should explain why posterior lateral is the way to go, which I have, uh, I hope this is going to work, um, is, um, yeah. So as you can see, the calcaneal tuberosity is very close to the lateral malleolus. And the tethering structures on the lateral side are more important. So once you release the posterior syndesmotic ligaments and the calcaneofibula, <laughs> it allows the wider part of the Taylor dome to come into the ankle mortis. So I feel that rather than a posterior medial, a posterior lateral release really helps in achieving correction, including in much older adults, either by itself, as we did in this young lad, and with lots of serial casting, or as a part of an extensive program involving external fixation. So the question is, does hardware matter? Does it have to be sophisticated like the TSF, like John uses, like many of you do, or the simplistic ones that many surgeons in India use called the Joshi's External Skeletal Stabilization System, or the simplest like the plaster, or should it be the Siberian Elizaro? So is it all in the software? What we really know is that the sequence matters. And who gave it to us? None other than Professor Ignacio Ponsetti. 
to whom I had the great privilege of spending a week in, nine, in 2001. All thanks to John, whose Baltimore limb deformity course I attended and got the first whiff of the Ponsetti technique after having treated almost six or 700 of them with serial casting and only Attenborough posterior soft tissue releases, something that I learned in Mumbai with wonderful results, never performed a single posterior medial soft tissue release in my life. I apologize if I'm ruffling any feathers, but this is my two attendants, um, attending surgeons in Children's Orthopedic Hospital. One performed only posterior medials. He was a brilliant surgeon. He got good results, and one performed only Attenborough posterior soft tissue releases. And I found that it is easy to perform a, and get a very good correction without breaching the important medial soft tissues, which lead to later on fibrosis, like um, uh, the, study, uh, the study that came from University of Rome that showed what happens when you do post-romedial soft tissue releases, you tend to get a lot of fibrosis and arthritis in the ankle and the subtalar joints. Uh, the gentleman was a colleague of Professor Consetti. We all know this sequence, and I had the privilege of developing the kinesiological sequence which attempted to faithfully reproduce the Ponsetti maneuvers using the Ilizaro fixator because of its modularity. So we have a construct specially for supination. There's a tailless olive wire from the lateral side to give counter pressure. There's a four foot abduction construct which allows us to get the mandatory 70 degrees of abduction and a special construct that allows the calcaneum to rotate freely like Dr. Ponsetti used to say, do not touch the calcaneum and then special ways of correcting the hind foot equinus. Hopefully this animation should give a brief overview of the way the whole system works. This is the four foot ring. As you can see, there's a force couple going on like turning a steering wheel. So you take the four foot into more supination because you want to match it with the excess supination of the hind foot. The four foot abduction is performed with a motor dropped off of the lower tibial ring. And as you can see, as the four foot abducts, the hind foot calcaneum, which is not connected to any of the rings, is allowed to abduct from underneath the talus. This part of the correction, the correction of the inversion is not mandatory and can be optional, but what's really interesting is the correction of the equinus. I found in the literature that there isn't a specific method described and I found the momentum vector method. This illustration doesn't do justice, but we have to, the hind foot motors have to always remain perpendicular to the moment arm. I will come to that briefly in, a, in just a moment. So here are some examples of the kinesiological correction. Uh, this is a young lad who had um, uh, neglected club foot. And this is the kind of assembly that we have, the serial correction. The forefoot ring has got two wires, which is perpendicular to the forefoot. The hind foot ring can be fixed with either a half pin and a wire or two small half pins. And you have two just, just two rings in the tibia, either with wires or half pins and the tailor wire is dropped off of the lower tibial ring with the olive on the lateral side. And by, achieving the, by performing the serial maneuvers, we can get a very good correction, especially giving note to what's happening at the level of the ankle joint. It remains spherical and congruent, is not over distracted, nor is there crushing of the subtalar joint. So let's look at some of these elements. What about the counter pressure on, on, on the, with the tailor's wire? So this is a lady, 32, mother of three, with this kind of a club foot, and these are her x-rays. I, I think I detected some sphericity in the Taylor dome, so I could go ahead and use this method. You can see the two rings in the tibia, standard fixation. Now here, because of the large size of the foot, I could attach the tailor's wire to a half ring to give better construct. And then we perform, firstly, of course, the supination, the forefoot abduction. And when that is done, the tailor's wire is switched from the tibial ring to the calcaneal or the hind foot ring so that the talus and the calcaneus move together as we perform the correction for her to achieve this kind of correction and even some amount of dorsiflexion in the foot. So an example to show how the calcaneal abduction works, this is a young lady at about uh, 21 years of age, this kind of club foot. There is some sphericity in the Taylor dome and here is her, her Elizar of apparatus so to follow Ponsetti's principles, we must allow the hind foot to remain free and allow it to abduct, not force it. And how do we do that? By, if you notice carefully, below the two tibial rings, there is a hind foot ring, which is not attached to the tibial rings, and there's a series of connections between the 
th there's a connection between the forefoot and the hind foot rings, which are kept in the passive mode. And we attach large rings to the lower tibial ring so that this hind foot ring, which is not attached firmly, not stably fixed, if it touches the bed and moves against it, it will cause pain. So it's kept off of the bed. And after we perform the hind foot abduction, then the equinus to give her this kind of a result. I finally, I'd like to explain the equinus correction with the moment arm correction method. This is a seven-year-old child who had a relapse after Ponsetti uh, method, uh, actually after a posterior soft tissue release. And here is this frame. After having completed most of the initial maneuvers, you notice the hind foot motor, which is attaching the lower tibial ring to the hind foot ring, and the extent to which it is angulated. And the x-rays on this side again show the amount of angulation. In textbooks, they talk about four to seven degrees of posterior angulation. But the crucial thing is that when we use any push constructs to allow the talus to glide and rotate into the ankle mortise, we not only have to remain tangential to the tailor dome, but we also have to remain perpendicular to the moment arm. Hopefully, these animations should explain it. This is the right way of doing things. This is the center of rotation of the talus. The moment arm is the imaginary line joining the center of rotation of ankle to the point of application of your distraction forces. So the force F resolves only into vector F2. There is no F1. So all the forces that you apply are transmitted and to allow rotation to occur around the center of rotation of the ankle and are not dissipated in any other direction. If, however, you don't get it right, What if the vectors are off, as, is as may frequently happen? Then what we see is, again, the center of rotation, the moment arm again. And if we apply the forces not perpendicular to the moment arm at an angle theta, this resolves into two vectors, F2 and F1. F2 performs most of the correction in the right direction, but F1 tends to force the ankle anteriorly. And since the equation is F1 is F into sine theta, we get some movement in F1 vector as well, whereas in the previous method, F1 is equal to zero. As a result of which, we will get a very accurate correction if we stick to these guidelines and get a good correction. And this is the kind of squatting method used typically in India that also shows very good dorsiflexion. So we did have our share of complications with this method, more than 70 of these done so far. And I am very grateful to John for not only introducing me to the Ponsetti method, for, but for giving me the opportunity to speak at this for the first time at the Baltimore Limb Deformity course. So we have seen lower tibial physial separations. So frequently, we now pass in a wire through the lower tibial physis. I have seen calcaneal thickening if we use a very strong construct in the calcaneum. And uh, um, uh, some wire cut-throughs. And of course, recurrence is due to faulty bracing or imp not having performed the tibialis anterior transfer. But what we haven't seen are subluxations, crushing of the cartilage, and over distraction of the ankle joint or a rock or bottom foot. So um, hidden tailor dome flattening always remains a problem. And at the end of several years, one may see a heaping up of a cartilage and formation of an anterior ostrophyte, much like a footballer's ankle. And that does remain a pr problem. Now, my brief was also to speak on osteotomy corrections. So very briefly, I'd like to show you. This is a lady who's 60 years of age, had a residual club foot deformity. Multiple surgeries have been done in the past. The foot is very badly scarred, and we don't want to go anywhere near this foot for the risk of creating neurovascular damage. So what comes to our rescue is the Ilizaro fixator and a supramalleolar osteotomy. Now you can see that the foot is plantigrade. This works on the principle of rule two, the center of rotation is at the lateral process of the talus, and the osteotomy is much above. So you have to perform a mandatory posterior translation of the distal fragment at the supramalleolar osteotomy. And that helps you to achieve the very good correction. The iconic V osteotomy and U osteotomy of Elizarov are very helpful, rather difficult procedures. I've had the privilege of watching great Russian surgeons at the Kurgan Institute do this. And somebody like this is 27 years of age, and he has a very stiff fibrotic club foot. Now, as Dror has pointed out, it is really mandatory to perform a tarsal tunnel release, and including at the very deep level, you know, at the second and the third levels where the nerve can be entrapped, and that can ensure that you don't end up with a catastrophic nerve problem at the end of these osteotomies. So here he is with the frame. Again, an animation should hopefully show um, 
in a very simple manner how the V osteotomy is performed because the X-rays are rather difficult to figure out. There's so much metal. And um, I must acknowledge the great work of Alex Kirienko, also a product of Kurgan Institute, who's a wonderful foot surgeon. So this is the V osteotomy, and you have fixation in the forefoot, in the hind foot, and uh, also in the talus. And if you pass in wires close to the anterior limb of the osteotomy, they really help you to pull the osteotomies apart and not have premature consolidations, as I have experienced in some of my cases. So as I told you before, it's really hard to see what's going on unless you are well prepared to understand. So these are some of the wires that help us to pull the osteotomy apart carefully, and this is this kind of result. So what the V osteotomy does is it regenerates two triangles of bone. You, we essentially get something like a, you know, a subtalar arthrodesis, and you have, there is a prevention of recurrence of the deformity. More complex ones like these can also be treated with the V osteotomy, and this is just to show that he had some movement in the ankle which we preserved after the foot correction by loosening the hinges and allowing it to get plantar and dorsiflexion, like so, to, uh, to give, get a pretty decent result in this manner. Now, the cavus that can be seen sometimes, isolated cavus, can be corrected only with the anterior limb of the V, and in an adult, we can create a rather very strong construct using plates rather than just the screws. There is this wire which is going at the apex of the, at the head of the talus, and to which, with uh, threaded bolts, we are attaching these strong plates and a distraction that's performed from the lower level for us to achieve correction of the cavus deformity through the anterior limb of the V, like so, which also functions to stabilize the ankle joint. The V osteotomy can also be performed to create an arch, as in this young girl who had a defect in the lower tibia as well as an equinoplanus deformity. The defect was taken care of, and this was an equinoplanus. And uh, what we performed was, again, this V osteotomy. Sorry about this. This is case performed almost 25 years ago. And there's two limbs that are being distracted apart in a different manner to create an arch, like so, and to give her a reasonably arched foot, even though the fo whole foot is translated entirely anteriorly. It's not the most perfect of results, but we can achieve this. I finally end with a U osteotomy, which is analogous to the Lambrinodes triple arthrodesis, in which if you have only equinus and there's no any other element of a deformity like a hind foot varus or valgus or a cavus deformity, you can perform the correction as is explained with this uh, rather simplistic animation, which shows how the, uh, the osteotomy lines are drawn. Uh, I know that the Kurgan Institute has special osteotomes, U-shaped osteotomes, but you can connect the dots, you can take small incisions, and you can connect the dots a little bit like a shallow V osteotomy, and to achieve this U osteotomy correction, it helps us to lengthen the foot as well, that's gain some spherion height as well as correct, and the equinus deformity, and it functions like a lambrinudes, as in this young man. Uh, I thank you very much for the uh, attention, and again, the opportunity to be amongst you. Thank you. That was an amazing talk, Dr. Chow. You're doing some incredible things out there.